All right, introduction to poker lecture six, let's go. Okay, so this today's lecture is on isolation races, three betting and four betting. So as a quick preface so far, um, we've covered a big bunch of chunks of preflop, which hands are good, which hands to raise, which hands to call, and how to adjust like these defaults that we have based on factors. So there's only a few pieces of preflop left to really cover. So the questions we're gonna answer today is how or when should we three bet? How or when should we play versus limpers? Because we said don't limp, but what happens if someone does limp? Um, obviously we're still missing some points. Like what do we do if someone three bets us or we, it goes call three bet and we've got a really good hand, what should we do? We're not gonna talk about those yet. Those are gonna save those for the end of the semester because those are kind of niche situations. We don't encounter that often. Um, and it'd be more productive to start going over post flop play. So today is the end of pre-flop for us for now. So quick review. So this concept we're actually gonna use a lot today. Um, required fold equity is the mathematically required success rate of a steal to break even. And it is R over PG plus R. And this is just a refresher from yesterday's lecture. So this we're actually gonna to use today. This is just a refresher um, of what we did last time. Uh, the gap concept is that we need to call with a stronger range than we would be open raising. Um, we have reverse implied odds against um, stronger earlier position raises. We have less initiative, less fold equity. In fact, we have zero if we just call. And by calling, we have a capped range. And so we're, we're opening ourselves up to aggression. So why would we call anyway? Uh, if our hand is good enough that we can call, we should call, but it's not good enough to raise for value and it's not bad enough to raise for a bluff. It's in that middle zone, then we can call. And then the key question is, is, is this hand good enough to flop hands that will destroy villains good hands because we need to make a whole bunch of money to justify calling because we're going to lose most of the time so we need to win a bunch of more right um, and for that to be the case we need to beat their good hands with our even better hands reason two implied odds so the seven factors are listed here uh, i advise you to go back and look at the last lecture recording or powerpoint if they if you're not very familiar with them I'll say that villains range strength and position have a bit more nuance than some of the others. Those are kind of straightforward. Uh, so villains range strength, uh, the stronger hands they have, the more likely they are to call huge bets when we make our hand. And if we have position, it's a lot easier for us to extract value. So reason three, weaker players, um, uh, implied odds of the fish are a huge boost. We like playing with weak players who will donate us money. Reason four, pot odds. Um, change with the investment we need uh, to see the next card. And when we're in the blinds, we get better pot odds. So that can justify calling when we might fold from a different position. So here we have in question mark, don't ever call from the small blind. Uh, we're actually gonna do some situations today where you can get away with limping and flat calling. Um, you can do anything in poker if you have good enough justifications for it and logical reasons. Uh, we gave you that never do it rule, and we're going to we're give some more nuance today as to what we mean by that. So limping and isolation raising. So to open limp is to call one big blind preflop as the first player to voluntarily enter the pot. So everyone else is folded before you, you decide to limp. Open limping is really bad. We don't like doing that, and we will never open limp. Or yeah, we'll never open limp. Limping behind uh, can we actually be okay. That's to call the one big blind after other players have done so. Um, this distinction might seem arbitrary, like, well, we're limping either way. What's the difference? And we're going to go over that today. So to understand why open limping is bad, um, let's go over like the strategic problems with it and then see why maybe limping behind doesn't have some of these problems. This is what it is where we just post the one big blind as an open limp. Limping behind is once we call after somebody else limps. That is not good or bad, but it can, be, it can be okay. So what's wrong with open limping? So number one point, it gives up all fold equity. I mean, these aren't in order, by the way, also. These are just four points. So it, it gives up all fold equity, so it can't steal the blinds and it can't thin the field. Um, those are two things that we like doing. So and part of the per reasons why we're raising, so we lose that. Um, stealing the blinds is a huge chunk of EV for us. It's just gone now. Uh, it seizes no initiative and it's asking other, it's giving other people the chance to grab the initiative to raise us and take control of the situation. Um, it fails to build a pot for value when we have a strong hand. 
And like we said, doesn't thin the field, invites multi-wave pots, and devalues our hands post-flop. So let's think about what open limping might, um, might have different from like limping behind. So um, a lot of these will still have the same problems. Um, I mean, we still give up fold equity, but we're gonna argue we wouldn't have that before. And then the other factors as well, limping behind has, has some arguments to make. So how would we exploit if someone else decided it was open limping? So when we have fold equity, we expect them to fold. We should raise a wide range and bet frequently to pick up this dead money that they limped with. They're a weak player, we are gonna run them over. Uh, we also wanna play more hands just to isolate this weaker player because we wanna be the one in position taking advantages of their mistakes post flop. We like playing pots with bad players. Um, and we'll last point, point number three, we should occasionally look to limp behind with hands that want to realize implied odds and see a cheap flop when we have a limited fold equity. And in this case, we'll play in a fitter fold manner, which means we either make our hand and we're really happy or we don't make our hand and we just give up. There's no getting sneaky and bluffy and tricky uh, when we limp behind. So the ISO triangle. So I will admit, uh, when I was making this lecture, uh, I'm working off this guy's uh, source on the internet. Like he's got some like so sort of lectures here and there. Some of this is original. A lot, like a good chunk of the stuff that we do in this class is from this guy's sources. So um, he uses this ISO triangle diagram to explain how to isolation raise. And as I was making this, I got up to about slide 40 before I was like, wait, why is this a triangle again? What, what is the point of this being a triangle? Um, and so basically just think about it as these three factors and the frequent strength is the most important factor. Fold equity is the second most important position is the third most. And if we're doing really good on the factors, we have a full triangle, then we limp or uh, then we isolation raise. And if it's an empty triangle, we limp or fold. So what is an isolation raise? Short for um, isoing is short for isolation. And then we raise it's when we raise versus limpers with the intention of either thinning the field to gain post-flop fold equity. We wanna be one-on-one -on -one with, this, with this player we've isolated, uh, or we wanna play a pot heads up with a weaker player. So in one, uh, they can be the same goal, but one side of it is we want less people to see the flops so that we can get folds later. And the other part of it, well, we wanna play a pot heads up with a weaker player. And there will be range charts today, but not for this section of it, the isolation raise. So here's what it looks like versus a limp, we raise to four. And you remember how we default raise to three? We're gonna talk later about we raise to four. Um, the main idea is pot odds, but I'll leave you with that for now. So yeah, back to that point I was making before, there are three sections to the triangle and the larger the area, the more influence it has in our decision, which is I guess why we went with the triangle. We could have done like a rectangle or something, I don't know. but. Uh, Frequent strength is the biggest area. It's the one that matters the most. And if we have good frequent enough frequent strength, we don't even need to care about the other two and we'll raise. Fold equity, second most important, position third most. Uh, so you should be familiar at this point with what fold equity and what position are, but what's frequent strength? Um, in simplest terms, frequent strength is just good pair potential plus versatility. Um, a frequent strength is how frequently it flops strong hands. Um, flopping strong hands means either flopping good pairs or flopping good draws or like flushes or something. So yeah, it's not too complicated. Um, when we ISO, we just wanna make good hands because um, we want to be able, they're probably gonna keep calling a lot of the time. So it's good to just have a strong enough hand. If, if we think that even if people call our isolation rays, we're gonna be fine because we're gonna make good hands enough, um, excellent frequent strength alone can justify an ISO. Fold equity is less crucial with excellent frequent strength. Um, it might be even better if we have good fold equity too, but it's not a big deal. And pocket aces has the most frequent strength. Let's look at some other examples. Ace queen has excellent frequent strength solely because of the good pair potential. Um, it's gonna flop strong dominating pairs so often that we love it. Uh, great easy slam dunk ISO. King Jack suited. Um, easy slam dunk ISO because we got one, the flush, that we can also make some straights. And King and Jack just make some really good pairs. Uh, key point I want to point out is in a lot of our earlier lectures still, we talk about how King Jack suited under the gun. It's like a dicey raise because you can be dominated, this or that. 
uh, things loosen up considerably like in later positions. So for example, like I love seeing like this hand in the cutoff beyond is a fantastic hand. It's amazing. It's, it's, I, I'm just seeing dollar signs. Hijack is still a great hand too. It's just, you start um, in earlier positions, you want to be more careful. Pocket tens, um, it's either going to flop over pair, a best under pair, like we, we've talked about two, seven Jack, that board pocket tens are probably still good. Um, and of course it can make a set one at every nine ish times. King 10 off is considerably weaker. Um, while it frequently does make decent top pair hands, the kickers are more easily dominated. We can't get flush draws. We can't really get straight draws, but even still clear isolation raise if the other factors aren't as negative. Now, ace five suited uh, has about the same frequent strength as king 10 off. So we've lost to the 10. So that's one ability to have good pairs that we've, that we've lost. So we've lost a bit of pair potential, but the ace is, is nice. And we also now can flop flush draws. We can get straight draws. And also the ace gives us higher showdown value. So let's say we don't make a pair at all or a flush or a straight. Ace five is stronger than king 10 because it's got that ace kicker. Showdown value is how likely we are to win at showdown unimproved. Uh, we're going to go over this more this coming week on uh, lecture seven onwards. Um, so ace five is uh, like, like we have at least ace high. And if us and our opponents both miss the board, well, an ace is good. We like an ace. Pocket sevens are just okay frequent strength. I can occasion flop an over pair or a decent pair set. But there's a lot of poor flops for this hand, so we do need help. Like, if we don't have fold equity or position, we're not going to isolation raise. doesn't mean we fold. We then decide whether to limp or to fold. So similarly, okay, frequent strength. Um, it doesn't have that high card value. It can't flop huge pairs, but it has that. So it has that versatility aspect of frequent strength. You can get flushes, straights, and it's not even bad at making top pair. It's just not good. But we still need a favorable situation. These are fairly poor frequent strength, substantially more of a favorable situation to qualify as plus EV isolations. Uh, granted, I'll still isolation raise these pretty often. If my opponent is that terrible, I have so much fold equity and I'm in position and I can roll them over. Yeah, I'll iso raise these. And these are the quality of hands where, yeah, you should not really be isolation raising these if like ever. Um, it has to be extremely favorable. Uh, there's been like, I think only a few situations where I've been, this player is such an extreme knit that limped and they fold every time they, they, they limp after a raise and I'm in position that I can justify my 10-3 suited raise here. Um, but these are pretty much in the non-ISO category. Brings us into our next factor, fold equity. The more fold equity we have pre and post, the more we want to isolation raise. So Biggest factor is the amount of limpers. If there's just one limper, we can probably isolate them and get a heads up. Uh, facing three limpers, it's gonna be pretty hard to get all of them to fold or even most of them to fold. Gonna be a, a large pot on the flop. So we have less fold equity, which disincentivizes isolation raising. And also if there are loose or aggressive players behind, this is gonna make us wanna raise less because we're more likely to get three bet or get called. Yeah. The third factor we care about when it comes to fold equity is the types of fish that we're up against. So we're going to encounter these in more detail later, but as a quick rundown, there's the fitter fold fish, which we've talked about fitter fold. If they make a good hand, then they go crazy. Um, and if they don't make a good hand, they fold it immediately. They are very straightforward, the most readable poker players in existence. My personal favorite to play against because I'll just make huge, I'll be able to make like a huge lay down after I've just seen how fit or fold they are. Um, or oh yeah, I'll fold, I'll fold two pair on the flop because you're just betting like an insane amount. And then you show that you flopped a set. It's like, oh wow, I'm so surprised. Um, type B is the calling station. Uh, a station in general is just referred to a player who calls way too many bets. So a calling station will, they'll get really attached to their middle pair and they'll call huge bets down to the river with their middle pair. Um, aggro fish, it's what it sounds like. It's really aggressive. Um, and then whales, um, yeah, they just are super splashy. They throw money everywhere. Uh, all, of these, all of these types of play, weak players are very profitable. Calling stations will call our bets. Fitter folds, we know exactly what to do. Aggro fish will dump money to us. Whales will do all of it, all of the above. So, yeah. 
Last factor, position. We're going to encounter position pretty much everywhere. Being the last player to act post-flop comes with huge advantages. Um, it adds full liquidity to bets post-flop because we're in position and people don't want to play out of position. It gives us control over the pot size. We can decide whether to bet, control the tempo. And we also, like always, we get that extra information. So now it's time to get into some hand examples. So importance of position. So wait, is this was supposed to be on a pier? Huh, that's strange. It was on a pier when I first presented this lecture. Maybe I accidentally changed it. All right, anyway, you see, uh, you see what we do. But okay, let's go through the factors. Factor one, frequent strength. Not great, but it's not bad. 9-8 offsuit, like, it's not the greatest thing, but we can make straights. We can make okay pairs. It's not terrible. Now, fold equity. So the small blind is a reg, so we can expect the reg not to get out of line. In general, you're going to fold a whole bunch from the small blind. So we can take them out of the equation. The big blind is a knit, uh, so they're probably not going to interfere with our plan. And then we have a position on this passive fish in the cutoff who probably going to call our bet, honestly. But then post-flop, we'll have a whole bunch of fold equity. Passive fish, and we're in position. We'll be able to run them over. Makes that alone. It makes it clear ISO. We got okay frequent strength. And then the passive fish will get run over because we've got so, and we've got so much fold equity. Now, I'm going to switch gears a bit. Just talking about all these ISO raising. Now we're going to talk about limping behind. So we're only six lectures in. You've heard say don't limp a bajillion times. Limping behind can sometimes be OK. Um, specific terminology you might see is to complete, which is to limp from the small blind, essentially call the last half of the big blind. And we're only ever going to do it if there's been other limpers before us. And sometimes we can then justify doing it. Um, we have strongly advised, do not do this. Do not do this. Just three better fold. And if you just close, close your ears and tune out the next part of lecture um, and just say, I'm always three better folding, it probably won't be too big of a deal for your win rate. But we want to, for a point of completion and consistency, we want to talk about when can you limp or complete from the small blind. So limping behind. Um, what can we do when there are limpers and we cannot justify an ISO raise? Our hand is not good enough to isolation raise. Uh, then we get into three factors again. And similarly, these were presented in triangle format. So the diagram on the next page is going to be a triangle, but just kind of think of them as their thing. So pot odds. Uh, the better price we're getting to call, the more inclined we should be to call. So for example, the small blind, it's only half a big blind more to limp. So we've got much better pot odds. Uh, for implied odds, um, we're gonna, it's going to justify limping, um, but we require both a hand that can extract value, a hand that can flop something like a flush or something like whatever. We also need villains that will pay us off and call our bets. Last thing we like is if we have post-flop steal potential. Um, if we expect we can get a lot of folds post-flop, if we somehow are in a nice situation to, to try to be the aggressor, when villain misses, they're a fitter fold, then we can limp. Here is our overcomplicated triangle chart. So we look at the ISO triangle, and if that's full, we ISO raise or close to full over half full. And then if not, we decide to look at the limping triangle and then do that. You can uh, take the triangles out of the equation if uh, you prefer to think about it as each factor logically. So now let's go over the importance of position. So if you remember with this hand back here, we decided to raise the four big blinds. We were in the button. Um, the big blind was in the knit and the reg was in the small blind. So we're gonna shuffle the seats a bit. Now the reg is in the big blind and then the button's in knit. So the cutoff calls, the button folds. And what do we wanna do now? So first look at the ISO triangle. Frequent strength says, once again, not great, far from useless. Fold equity. Well, it's still favorable versus the limper, but the difference is, is the big blind isn't a knit now. The big blind is a reg, has position on us, and it'll make it hard to get heads up with the cutoff. It might get us make us vulnerable to three betting, give us grief post flop. Full equity is a lot worse. Of course, we don't have position. So, because of this seat swap, now that the we're in the small blind and the regs and behind us versus a knit, we can't iso raise. So, what about the limping triangle? Pot odds are great. Uh, it's only half a big left to call and the pot's 2.5. We're getting five to one odds. We need to win 16% of the time to call. <laughs> the implied odds are uh, okay. Um, we can flop two pair straights and draws on equation. 
um, and there is a fish in the pot who may fail to fold a good pair to our straight. It's just we really want to play with this passive fish. So implied odds are good, pot odds are good. Last question is post flop steal potential. So this one's a bit trickier. Uh, oftentimes the cutoff will be fit or fold. Uh, and when the reg also misses, the reg might not be inclined to bet or they check or we go first and we can take down the pot right there. So all three factors are good, justify a limp. We like playing pots with fish to the point where we will limp, 9-8 offsuit in the, bit, in the small blind just to get with the cutoff. That's what we call. All right. So the main reason we just inserted that bit about limping in the middle there was so that we could have this digression where we compare. All right, here we'd ISO raise, here we'd limp behind. Let's go back to ISO raising. So we're gonna talk about now, how do you size that isolation raise we talked about? And very dynamic, it'll change drastically, but here is the following general rule. Um, we should raise to our default three big blinds and then add one for each limper and an extra one when hero's out of position. So this rule will give us enough fold equity to get the aims of the ISO, but at fishy tables, because players behind are so likely to call, we should go even bigger to punish them. So at live one, two, I'll raise to at least $10 facing a limper. I mean, a lot of times we'll even start raising to $15 facing one limper. So a 7.5 X, just because I know like I'm going to get calls, like even no matter how big I go. So yeah, and here, why, why do we pick this size? Uh, the key idea is that we need to call them more money to call um, because there's more dead money in the pot. Plus it's going to cost them one less because they've already invested a big one. Their pot odds improve significantly and they can easily call a raise more often. So to compensate, we increase our sizing to reduce the pot odds. Yeah. Example. So King 10 suited. First off, this hand is a clear isolation raise. Why? The frequent strength is great. King 10 suited. We can make straights, we can make flushes, versatilities there, we can make good pairs. Full equity is not as nearly as good because we've got this cutoff and the cutoff, we've got a passive fish behind and we've got an aggro fish in the small blind. And then there's some regs as well. So fold equity is less good, um, but we're in position to the under the gun limper running a 56-17. That's crazy. A 56-17 is a terrible player. And so, um, we want to play with them. Um, by the isolation sizing rule, uh, we'd go by default to three plus one equals four big blinds. But because players behind are more likely to call, we're going to size up. We want to charge this passive fish and maybe this aggro fish in the small blind. So we go to five big blinds instead. Now, let's say on the other side of the coin, um, we have aggressive three betters behind. Look at these regs, red three bed number, uh, three bet numbers. 11% is huge. 7% in the big blind is definitely respectable. Same with five there for the small blind player. That's not high, but it's respectable. Um, so uh, we definitely still want to isolation raise because again, the under the gun is terrible. There are 54, uh, 45, six uh, and ace jack has got a lot of frequent strength. It's a good hand. So we want to isolation raise. Our rule would tell us by default, we raise to three plus one limper to four big blinds. But we know that because all these three bet happy players are behind us, we need to be able to defend better against three bets. And the way we can defend better is by raising smaller um, so that when we do get three bet, we can fold more easily or they, it's to a smaller amount. So we downsize to protect ourselves against uh, aggression and from getting abused. All right, general example. So again, isolation triangle here. Uh, this hand, okay, frequent strength. It isn't amazing, but far it's far from terrible. Uh, straights, flushes, we can make some pairs. Um, yeah, fold equity. Uh, we've got actually pretty decent fold equity. Um, we're only really worried here about the uh, big blind as a reg. Um, hijack can call, but again, post flop, we're never chilling. Uh, yeah, fold equity is very good. Um, limpers passive. Position, great, because we're on the butt. All three things are in our favor. ISO raise, yeah. Hold on. All right, and that takes us to the crash course on three betting. Again, I'm amazed by my ability to talk quickly doing these recordings. This took way more time in person. You're at like minute 45 here. 
So there are two different kinds of three bedding, linear and polar. We'll do linear first here. Linear is a three bet range that consists solely of hands we want to three bet. Uh, and we may or may not have a range to call the open. So if someone open raises, we'll, we'll have hands we want to three bet because they're good. And then we might have hands underneath that will call. We don't always need to call it. We, it could just be we either three bet or fold like from the small blind. A polar range is considerably more complicated because now we've added bluffs. So we have hands we three bet for value. We have hands that we call and hands that we bluff with. So when we're, when we're playing a polar strategy, we need to have hands that we call with. Um, yeah, that sits between the value and the bluffs. The, the idea would be is that if we had hands that were good enough to call, we were three betting them as bluffs, like why would we do that? And if we had a strategy where we three bet these hands for value, folded the eh hands in the middle and then three bet the bluff worse hands, it wouldn't make sense either. So we end up just, um, we need a call range. Um, yeah, and we kind of do it. If it's good enough to raise for value, we three bet. If it's good enough to call, uh, then we call. If it's just barely not good enough to call, then we start three bet bluffing. So charts look like this. Um, yeah, and here, the reason you see this question marks on hands with blockers, what's a blocker? Big pick bluff with board coverage, what's board coverage? We're going to save polar um, three betting for later in the semester because it's a bit complicated. Uh, for now, I'd say we're just going to focus on linear three betting strategies because they're straightforward and they're the ones we're going to use the most. Um, so here's our typical decision chart will look like. For now, we're just going to ignore this whole polar branch because it's hard. We're going to go linear only. So what is linear three betting? Uh, it is mostly with hands that we think are good and want to get in for value. Uh, there's two times we use it when we have limited fold equity and we don't just want a flat call. So limited fold equity would occur. Um, well, we don't want, like if we say we had a lot of fold equity, then you'd want a three bet as a bluff, right? But if we have no fold equity, then why would we bluff? We should only be playing good value hands. Uh, so that's situation one. Uh, and it's also when we just don't want a flat call. So we said that a polar range needs a calling range. Well, what if we just never want to call? Like we're in the small blind and we don't want to just call somebody's open raise. Um, or if there's an aggro player behind that might squeeze us if we call. In this case, we should only be three betting or folding. So we should be playing a linear range. So reason one, not enough fold equity. So here um, we're in the cutoff. Um, we definitely want to play pots with the aggro under the gun player. And we want to be three betting pretty often because he's, this guy's crazy. He's raising 37% of hands. Uh, that being said, they're so crazy that we don't have a we don't have any full equity. We shouldn't have a bluffing range because we're, they're not going to fold. So yeah, we do want to call with some hands though, like pocket fours, six seven suited. We have implied odds, uh, even though our full equity is quite poor. Um, so we shouldn't bluff with them either. So our range also doesn't have to be tight because we want to isolate this player and be the beneficiary of their mistakes. So. We can three bet, and try to get everyone else to fold and get heads up with this player. So it ends up looking like this. Notice we again call a lot of these implied odds hands, uh, our ace five suiteds and our pocket fives, uh, and we'll be three betting for value with um, the just strong dominant hands. Reason two, we don't just want a flat call. So we're in the small blind here. Uh, the big blind is uh, has a high three bet percentage. They're a reg. They're gonna put some pressure. We, we can't just get away with just calling here in the small blind. It's This would be our nightmare scenario. That being said, we would love to have bluffs because this cutoff overfolds. Unfortunately, we have to play linearly. We'd love to be polar, but because we can't have a calling range, we need to be linear. Yeah, so we need to play a linear strategy and we are still only three betting our strongest hands now, but some we're gonna plan to call an all in with, others to fold. So they're, oh, the bluff is the wrong word, but they're hands that we feel good enough to three bet with, but not good enough to call an all in with. Ends up looking like this. Yeah, it's exploitative. We want the extra fold equity. So we're playing a bit more hands we might otherwise. Um, and so we'd be folding to, um, yeah, we basically with this strategy, we'd actually be folding to four bets a bit too much uh, given the required fold equity. But because the cutoff is an overfolding reg, we don't expect to see too many four bets out of them. Um, so we can be exploitative and deviate here. 
yeah. And we choose our hands based on brute strength, playability, and blockers. So here's where I am going to mention blockers. You see we're playing these ace-5, 4-3-2 hands here and a lot of these suited aces. The best way to think about it is if there is an ace in our hand, there's only three aces left in the deck. Therefore, it's less likely our opponent has aces, so it's more likely they'll fold to our bet. Um, you, you can end up doing the probability, and it actually becomes, it sounds small, but it becomes a huge thing where it's like 50% likely they have a hand, less likely they have a hand with aces or pocket aces when we have an ace blocker. And blockers are a huge part of high-level theoretical hold'em. So, sizing a three bet. Um, a key mistake is they size it incorrectly. We've seen a lot of people raising to like 14 versus a raise of six. So we should go to about three times again and then add one for every caller and one if out of position. So if someone raises to six, we can three bet anywhere from 18 to 20. Uh, doesn't matter too much which. Um, if there's an extra caller, we have to add on another one X. We three bet to 24 to 26. Um, or if we're out of position, we're in the small blind, we add on one more to make them pay a bigger price to play a pot with us when we're out of position. So it kind of visually would look like this. It's about a little over 3x, like 3.16x, I think there, 3.16. Yeah, around 3x is fine. So here are some common exploits when it comes to our three betting. Um, the more fit or fold they play, we should be inclined to open up our three bet. Um, we'll have post-flop fold equity so we can play more hands. Uh, the crazier they play, same thing if they're crazy pre-flop, we need to be able to make more strong hands. We need to be able to defend against aggression, so you might have to tighten up. Um, last point is fish defend a lot of their range to three bets as a natural tendency. Like People way over defend. Um, so the wider that they open, the wider we should feel comfortable three betting for value because they're going to call a whole bunch too. All right, so four betting. Um, again, this is like more of an after like afterthought, like this doesn't, doesn't come up that often. But when we four bet, our main goal is to get as much money as possible with our super premium hands. We're gonna mix in some bluffs so that um, no one doesn't know for sure we have pocket aces because then it just makes life easy for them. But it's okay, they know we probably have a really strong hand. At this point, when they three bet us, they're saying, I've got a really strong hand. So it's okay that we four bet and say, you know, I think mine's even stronger. It's We can let them have that information. Um, and again, we shouldn't get too sneaky with our aces or we shouldn't get try to get too fancy and bluff a whole bunch with our weak hands. We should mostly be betting with our strong hands. We shouldn't be setting traps with pocket aces. Just don't be fancy, ABC poker, raise. So here is an example four bet range chart. If you notice, this looks kind of freaky. Um, and it's a serious oversimplification that could definitely be misleading. We always need to include rain, um, like bluffs in our four bet range, because if it's just all value hands, it'd be aces, kings, queens, jacks, ace, king. Like that's not good. <laughs> and everyone will just fold. Um, and don't get too fancy. A lot of mistakes beginners, a big mistake a bunch of beginners make is they see ace five suited and their eyes light up and they say, this is it. It's my chance to go crazy and four bet for no reason. Um, if it ends up being in a favorable situation, you're like, okay, I can, I can raise ace five suited here. Oh, I got three bet. Oh, it makes sense to four bet bluff here. Then you can, you can work it in. Um, same thing with the six, five suited and the seven, six suited. Uh, I'd actually advise if like, cause again, I don't want people to just get out of line with this craziness The bluff with ace jack off suit instead. If we block aces, um, and it's, it's less of a downside if we're doing it too often, cause it's not a bad hand. Um, jacks are often too weak to four bet against villains under the gun. Like if villain raises under the gun, I'm not four betting jacks. Um, um, three bets me on run of the gun. I'm not going to four bet jacks against them. That'd be nuts. Uh, last point, you might be wondering why some of these are marked yellow as four bet folds. So ace five suited, we like to four bet it because it can make flushes. It can make straights. Um, and because it has the ace blocker. Um, we like seven, six suited and six, five suited because it can make flushes, it can make straights, and it also just connects with lower cards on the board. Um, if we want, this goes again, board coverage, we're going to do more in detail later, so we're putting it off, but we don't want it. If we only had jacks plus, once the board comes like seven, six, five, our opponent knows, well, they don't have a strong hand here. This is easy for me. They don't have a good hand, so I can just bully them relentlessly. You want to be able to have good hands on a variety of board textures. And yeah, last point, value hands more frequent than bluffs. 
Okay, sizing a four bet. So a key mistake a lot of players make is assuming that we're also going to four bet two or three times because that's what we raise to, that's what we three bet to, so that's what we four bet to, right? Not actually. We want to go to around 2.1x uh, and out of position 2.3x. And if there are callers, and this is very rare, we're not going to add a full 1x. We're going to round like 0.7, uh, 0.75. Doesn't happen very often. Here's some quick examples. We'd want to four bet a $20 raise to like 42. So why this change from three to two? Uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. So to talk about it, we're going to talk a bit about minimum defense frequency. This is the percentage of our overall range we need to call or raise with to prevent villain from exploiting us. So if villain has a required fold equity on a bluff of like 60%, if we fold more than 60% of the time, then uh, villain can just bluff per, like bluff profitably with any hand. So we need to call at least 40% so that we don't fold 60%. Now, if we end up calling even more than that, say we call 50%, then villain is actually incentivized to bluff less and value bet more because we're calling too much. We um, end up wanting to call about minimum defense frequency percent of the time to be profitable, play profitably. So here's where the key idea comes in. Um, villain only has to call minimum defense frequency of their hands facing our four bet. When villain three bets us, they're already saying, oh, I've got a really strong range. So if we blindly four bet to three times, we no longer put villain in a tough situation. The minimum defense frequency against our raise is so small that villain can pretty much just play their best possible hands and still be profitable. Before they're kind of on the fence in this tough spot where they say, man, I have pocket jacks and I'm facing a four bet. Should I call? What do I do? When we make it too big, we're just like, oh, I can fold. It's not a big deal. Um, another big deal is stack to pot ratio. Um, if we four bet to 100 bucks and villain only has 150 left, their only real options are to go all in or fold. Uh, the pot odds end up being, it ends up giving them an advantage with the pot odds, basically, um, where they're getting a better price on a call. Uh, it's, wait, sorry, give me a sec. Yeah, so we want to avoid bloating the pot early. We want to avoid giving them an easy choice. And then the last part of it is just range narrowing. Or well, Yeah, sorry. Last part of it for, sorry, talking about range narrowing, talking about uh, stack to pot ratio is for deep stack poker. Um, if this, none of this stuff about four bet sizing applies if the stacks get really deep. So we're, we're, for our class, we're assuming people are playing 100 big blinds deep. Let's say they're playing 400 big blinds deep. Um, in these kind of situations, uh, all of a sudden, well, now they're not getting, they can't just go all in for 400 big blinds. The pot's currently like only sitting at like 30 or 40. They don't have the odds to do that. Um, it also, yeah, they, it's just, there's also way more implied odds for us because instead of standing to win the like 80 big blinds they have left, you're now saying to win the 380 they have left. Um, so in these situations, we do start four betting at three times again. So we, we'd four bet to three X. Uh, but then we'd like five bet to two X, or we might even five bet to three X and six bet to two X if it's insanely deep stack poker. Um, and as you can probably guess, then the deeper the stacks are, poker gets more strategically complex and confusing. If imagine you only each player only had one big blind in front of them, then your options are go all in or fold. That's not very complex. The more money you add, the crazier things get. There's more implied odds and risk things we're risking at stake. So yeah, should it should be it for today's lecture. There's a visual of the four bet sizing. If they raise 9.5, we'd go to like 20. Yeah. And yeah, that's it. We're done with preflop for now. I'd say what to think about in the meantime, try really hard to use correct bet sizings. Very easy way to get a massive jump in expected value. Picking the correct bet sizings will make you so much money. And all it takes is a matter of kind of being conscientious about, okay, what here I should be four betting to about this or three betting to about this, following the rules. Anyway, see you soon.